Part 1. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Arthur C. Clarke. Chapter 1. A World of Possibilities. Oh, why me? The thought gnawed at Sam as he slumped at his school desk. It was a day they had all dreaded. Parents spouting the joys of their profession in front of the entire class. He rubbed his eyes. At least his father had been promoted and was no longer just a patent clerk, though Jasper was still quick to point out that Einstein had once been. Jasper Van Sant looked nervous, his hands fidgeting in the lap of his faded tweed suit as Sally Jacobs' mother droned on about insurance. Despite a classroom of rapt faces, not one student would recall five words from her speech. All of them were instead focused on the glamour and gossip surrounding her brief appearance on The Apprentice. "'Any questions?' Mrs. Jacobs purred. Twelve hands shot into the air. "'About selling insurance,' the teacher clarified. There was a rustle of retreating cotton. Yes, Adam. Mrs. Walsh bit off each word. Sighs and cross-eyed expressions spread, heads lolling back. Adam Pinniswood was dull. He put the D in ditch water, and he was also a pretentious know-it-all. Sam drifted off as the Pinniswood inquiry began his voice becoming a distant murmur. Despite being tall and athletic, with an infectious smile and quick wit, Sam was new to St. Vincent's and treated like an outsider. Born in England, but raised in Southern Africa, his parents were far from affluent, and his scholarship to the private school was an affront to many elitist sensibilities. He glanced over at Victoria. She was the other outsider in their year though her mother was some hotshot with a big tech company, so she was considered a fitting addition. Must be nice to feel you belong. She caught his forlorn gaze and winked back. Mr. Van Sant? The teacher invited his father to take the floor. Jasper tripped as he approached the lectern, and Sam's gut tightened. Um, thank you, Mrs. Um... Surreptitiously, he checked his sweaty palm. Walsh, he deciphered the letters. The teacher smiled awkwardly, then nodded towards the class. Right, uh, hello everyone, I'm Jasper, Sam's father, and I work for the patent office in London. It's my job to oversee the team responsible for cataloguing and storing all patent applications. Sam heard someone yawn. <sighs> loudly at the back of the room, prompting a titter of laughter. Mrs. Walsh fixed the perpetrator with a stern gaze. Mr. Van Sant continued, Every year we receive thousands of applications from inventors, scientists, and businesses all over the country. They send all matter of weird and wonderful ideas. My department processes them and ensures none are misplaced or forgotten. Now you may wonder why all this is important. No, <laughs> came a reply from behind a concealing hand. This time the laughter was loud and unrepentant. That's enough, Mrs. Walsh declared. Who wants to spend their afternoons trimming the faculty lawn with blunt nail scissors? Mr. Van Sant abandoned his notes and stepped out from behind the lectern. Everything you want, every road you take and decisions you make, will be in pursuit of a particular arrangement of atoms. The room fell silent. Sam noticed a few of the children exchanging confused glances, but the silence held. Everything you are, Everything you see, everything that has been or, or ever will be, no matter how magical or mundane, is nothing more than an arrangement of atoms. We're all just atoms. 
The one thing that defines us, however, is their arrangement. A fabulous arrangement of atoms promises unlimited potential. Two girls, heads bent, return to their phones. Pulling a device from his pocket, Jasper flicked a switch. This arrangement, for example... The girls jumped when Mr. Van Sant's voice blared from their respective speakers. Allows you to commandeer the broadcast capability of any active electronic device within a 20-foot radius. Mrs. Waltz confiscated the phones. The offenders blushed. Sam and the rest of the class snickered. Jasper held up a small silver stick with a neon purple tip. Can anybody guess what this is? A boy near the front shrugged. Looks like a match. First prize. But what makes it special? He scraped it across the lectern, producing a trail of greenish-blue sparks. The class were enchanted by the chemical fire. This time, there was awed silence. Jasper banished the flame and relit the match to demonstrate its capabilities. All eyes were now firmly on him. Sam's hand strayed to the faded scars on his forearm. He was not a fan of fire. Strike a lot matches, just one of a, a thousand prototypes that never made it to production because the patent was quashed by billionaires or, or, or greedy conglomerates. There's a host of, of brilliant ideas, truly spectacular arrangements of atoms, dying a dusty death. Except, of course, during a time of war. He waited. The hook was baited. What does that mean? Big Col, the rugby captain, tried not to seem too interested. Sam watched as his father leaned forward. It means, Jasper began in a hushed tone, that when Britain is at war, the government will use any patent or power to protect the sovereignty of the crown. Remember that the electric car was invented 60 years ago. There could be light bulbs that never burn out, hover shoes, jet packs, yet they remain untouched scribbles on my shelf. But in wartime, all bets are off. A boy at the back sat up. What about weapons? Guns, bombs, lasers, flying cars, robots. The existence of such unimaginable wonders fed their dormant imaginations. And for the first time in ages, excitement seized the room. A time machine, bottomless bags, atomic batteries. The list mushroomed in both scope and extravagance, every student jostling for their flight of fancy to be heard. Sam could not help grinning at his father. Mr. Van Sant leaned back and tapped his nose in a knowing manner. Official Secrets Act, I'm afraid. He delivered with aplomb. I'm sworn to silence by the king himself. His voice dropped to a whisper. But there are secrets in my archives. So fabulous, so incredible. They could change the world forever. He paused, every ear held, if they ever got out. An odd, whoa, and the odd expletive followed. Mrs. Walsh, ignoring the latter, stepped forward and began to clap. Thank you, Mr. Van Sant, for that very surprising insight into the world of the patent office. The students followed her lead, the whole class in awe of Sam's father. Could the tide have just turned in his popularity stakes? Questions? The teacher asked. It took ten minutes for the din to subside. Sam closed the front door of the old gatehouse. Arthur's rest had been in his family for generations. It was a tall, narrow stone building with a stout studded door and high-pitched roof. Beneath the swept eaves and ornate gables, climbing roses and ivy wound their way around narrow leaded windows and carved stone mullions. Sam's bedroom was in the octagonal turret 
which overlooked the vast grounds of the Witheringham estate and their own modest, quintessential walled English garden. He shrugged his bag onto the hall table and caught the edge of a neatly addressed envelope. The letter slid to the floor unnoticed and disappeared beneath a thick mahogany dresser. I'm home! In the kitchen! His mother's reply was followed by shrieks of delight. Sammy! Sammy! The twins roared into view, covered from pigtail to plimsoll in sugar, flour and dough, and caught him in the lounge. They leapt upon their older brother. We baking! You're kidding! <laughs> he spread his arms and gawked at them theatrically. Tugging at his shirt, the little girls ushered him towards their heinous laboratory in the kitchen. Surrounded by rolling pins, pastry cutters and deformed offerings to the cookie gods, his mother smiled warmly. Dusting her hands on her apron, she leant over to kiss him. Judging by the lack of bruising, I'm assuming that your father didn't completely ruin you. Sam grinned. He gave the fabulous Atom speech, whipped out a few toys and somehow had them eating out of the palm of his hand. The rest of the day had been surreal. By home time, the entire school had heard about his father being a mad scientist who used a flamethrower and fired a prototype laser at the head teacher. The twins, oblivious to the conversation, were hiding under a table and feeding dough to the dog, who was nearing a sugar-induced seizure. Girls, no more for Chloe, their mother warned. If she pops, there'll be an awful mess and you'll have to clean her up. The front door slammed and Sam was barreled aside when the diabolical duo leapt up again. Dada! Dada! Jasper and Danji listened to their son relive his day whilst they ate. The twins were swapping spoonsfuls of green jelly and thick yellow custard. Very little, however, was finding its way into either mouth. And I've been invited to go to the cinema on Saturday in Leicester Square. Big Kong's dad invested in a production company and has tickets to a world premiere. All the stars will be there. Fantastic, Angie said. But your father or I will drop you off and collect you. I'm not having you running around London on your own. Sam's face fell. But I'm fifteen. Barely. I'm... We're very happy that the boys are finally including you, but you're not going on your own. Maybe your father can go into the office and catch up on some work. Jasper raised a finger to object. However, further debate was interrupted by Chloe, who stood up, retched, and parted company with several pounds of cookie dough. The girls, convinced that the dog had in fact duly popped, screamed and fled. Saturday, rather disappointingly, took all week to arrive. Sam had fended off several earnest visitors from school with the news that his father had been summoned away on business. But this revelation had only fed the rumour mill, expanding both curiosity and Sam's burgeoning popularity. Ready? Jasper called. Sam finished the message he was sending, slammed his feet into his trainers, and gave his blonde hair the tenth check before heading down the stairs three at a time. The train ride into London was cramped. It always was. Sam sighed. Ah, oh, loudly for the umpteenth time in this half-hour journey. Spit it out, his father said. Do we have to go to your office? It's so boring. Can't we do something else, please? It'll be fun. Sam wasn't convinced. He was already impatient and uncomfortable in the hot sardine can carriage. A man with an offensive body odour stood too close, and the smell of garlic made him gag. The man gave Sam a withering look and shuffled away slightly. Jasper made a face at him, and Sam shrugged. Turning, he noticed a very cute girl through a new gap in the packed bodies. Perhaps this trip would present other opportunities. His mood lifted considerably when their eyes met, 
and the girl smiled at him. Now, if he could only ditch his dad.